everyone, this is Miss Wilson. We're going to continue today with Chapter 1, which is Introducing Environmental Science and Sustainability. This is our second lecture, and we're going to be talking today about the ecological footprints of our growing human population. If you take a look at what's happened to the human population over the last several million years, you can see that you get kind of a J-shaped curve here. And this curve is known as an exponential growth pattern. And you can see that exponential growth starts off very slowly, but as time goes on, the curve is going to become increasingly steep. And the population is going to start growing very quickly. So demographers, which are, who are people who study populations, they actually predict that our human population is going to level out sometime in the next century or so, and they think it's going to be anywhere between 7.96 and 10.46 billion. No one's exactly sure where it'll end up. I want you to take a look at some of the things that may have caused this increase in population. Back far bef in the years of BC, um, the human population, when it first originated, was more of a nomadic hunting and gathering population. They moved around a lot. They didn't have a lot of stability. There was a lot of things that they had to worry about in trying to survive. As time went on, you can see that we progressed to more of an agricultural revolution. At this point, people were staying on their farms. They were able to grow food to make it through the winter rather than relying on what they were finding. They started to have communities where they had people they could rely on. So this helped to increase the population somewhat, but you can see it still hasn't gone up by very much in terms of billions of people. You can see it start to go up at the end here a bit in the medieval times. But then we had the Black Death come along and take out one in three people, and that brought it down quite a bit again. However, it rebounded pretty quickly, and part of the reason for that is something we call the Industrial and Medical Revolutions. So let's talk about some of these changes and why they're so important. As I said, the Agricultural Revolution allowed people to stay in one place, which gave them a lot of stability. Then later on with the Industrial and Medical Revolution, this allowed them to shift from living in rural villages that were very spread out to urban places, cities, where they could all come together and communicate effectively and quickly. Uh, now, at the same time, since we have these cities developing, we have to have a way to deal with the problems that come about. So what happens is as we get new technologies, we're able to improve the sanitation in these cities, our control over diseases, and this is going to increase the population even more now that we have healthier people if they're going to live longer. Now we, a lot of people say that we're in an information or globalization revolution. At this point, you can get on your computer and access information from all over the world at any point in time. It also means that people who are selling products have um, access to a global marketplace. People can travel around the world very easily. Goods can get from one place to another very easily. This has a lot of implications for population as well, and we expect it to only keep increasing the population as time goes on. Now, you can see that there are many trade-offs, advantages and disadvantages to this industrial medical revolution. And many of them are listed here. If you'd like, you can take a second, pause the video and jot some of them down. In general, our quality of life has gone up quite a bit, but a lot of times the ecosystems pay the price of this because many of our new practices increase either pollution in the environment or increase the amount that we are otherwise degrading or breaking down that environment by either using it up or adding things that weren't there before. This comes back to that whole idea of sustainability. We don't want to use more resources than we need for the next generation to be able to survive as well. We don't want to exceed the carrying capacity that our environment can support. So if you kind of take a look here, again, these same eras that we just talked about, you can see that we've been growing exponentially. There's some discussion that we may have actually already reached the carrying capacity. No one's really sure what the carrying capacity of Earth is, and it also kind of depends on our technologies and how we're able to survive. 
So the big question is, where is the human population going? Are we heading into a sustainability era where we learn to manage things wisely, or are we headed for an ecological overshoot and collapse of our population? Our human population is currently at over 7 billion people in the world. And if you go to a world population clock, which you can easily find by Googling, you can see exactly how fast it's growing. So I'd actually like you to pause the video here and find the current, most up-to-date human population. And I want you also to consider how much it has changed since I filmed this video. This is being filmed on August 27th of 2014 at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It's probably not that long since you started um, watching it, and you've probably seen quite a big increase already. All right, so why is this population growth such a big problem? Well, for a number of reasons, not just environmental reasons, but for reasons of what we call environmental justice. Not all populations are affected equally by these problems, by overexploiting the environment. If we look at the worldwide population, 40% of them, almost one in two people, live in extreme poverty. That means they can't find basic things like food, clothing, shelter, health. Uh, they can't get medicine. They can't meet their population needs without exploiting those resources. And if we start to look at the gap in these populations, it turns out there's a big difference between the rich and the poor. In the highly developed countries, or what we call HDCs, these are countries like us, like Canada, like Japan, much of Europe, where you have a very um, well-developed industrial system and usually a fairly healthy economy. Uh, you have low population growth in these areas because things have started to stabilize, and there's very high per capita income, which means that the average family makes a fair amount of money, enough to live comfortably. Then we go down to the less developed countries, and there is a step in between called moderately developed countries, MDCs, but we're going to focus on the HDCs and LDCs. So these LDCs, they're not very industrialized. Most people still work on the farm or out of their home in some way. They may work in cities, but things are still not as urbanized as they are here in the US. There are very high fertility rates in these areas, and lots and lots of kids are being born, but there's also high infant mortality rates, so many of them are dying soon after. And these, their per capita income is much lower. So families, the average family is not taking home very much. So examples of this would be places like Bangladesh, Mali, Ethiopia, parts of Mexico, any of what you think of as third world countries. And you can see on this map here, the lesser developed countries are the ones with the highest levels of poverty. And you can see them there in red. And then as you get more and more yellow and actually even closer to white, those are the more wealthy countries, which are considered the HDCs that are more well established as well. If we take a look at this globally, some things that are a little disturbing is that even though um, we have such a big population, it's not evenly spread out. Most of that population, 82% of it, is in those LDCs, those developing countries. Um, and most of our population growth is occurring there. However, most of the wealth and resources are being used and obtained in the highly developed countries. And most of the pollution is actually being produced by those highly developed countries too, even though they have fewer people. Um, these are some population numbers. They're a little bit out of date now, but you can just see how many people are in individual countries. This, of course, has an impact on the environment. The more people you have, the more resources you need to use. If you have a large number of people in poverty, they put so much stress on the resources that you see all of these problems developing. They, have, they don't have access to all of these things that they need to survive. And this leads to lower life expectancies, like we said before, higher infant mortality, and 
often to illiteracy and lower education levels as well. So we're going to start talking about overpopulation, and there's actually two different types of overpopulation. The one you probably think of is what we call people overpopulation, which is just too many people, and you don't have enough resources to support them. This is usually the problem that we see in those LDCs, or developing nations, where there are higher levels of poverty. In the U.S. and in other HDCs, we have what we call consumption overpopulation, where there's not that many people, but each individual is consuming too large of a share of the resources, more than their own share. And because of this, there's not enough to go around. Again, not because there's too many people, but because of this, what's called unsustainable consumption of resources. Sometimes this is referred to as affluenza. When people are affluent, they spend more, they consume more. So they're addicted to products, to buying things, to being concerned with materialistic things. Um, and it uses up resources to do that. So it's the idea of, okay, in the third world, it, you may be worried about where am I going to find my next meal? Whereas here, you want to know where am I going to get my next video game? Right? So it's a totally different outlook on life. These things lead to what we call our ecological footprint. This is basically a visual way to see how much resources you use. So how much of the land, the water, everything around you are actually affecting. And we're going to be calculating this soon in class. So I want you to kind of compare. This is kind of the actual ecological footprint of a person in India compared to the U.S. You can see that they do not take up anywhere near as many resources as the average U.S. citizen. And because of this, we're able to coexist. And when you put all of the world's ecological footprints, the system is sustainable. We can exist together and only use up one worth Earth's worth of resources. However, if every person in the world uses what we use, which is really only fair, you can see that we would need many more Earths in order to survive. So in order to measure this, there is a model that we can start to use to figure out the environmental impact that every population has. And this was developed by Paul Ehrlich and John Holden in the 1970s. And it's a mathematical model that basically says our environmental impact is equal to the number of people in the population and multiplied by the affluence or the consumption that that person has, the number of resources they're going to use, and the environmental impact of any technologies that we have. So if you take a look, you can see that in developing countries, you probably have a larger population, even in a single family. But that population is often consuming less because they're not as affluent. And then they also usually have fewer technologies. And technology can go either way. Technology can actually be very efficient and actually make us less, use less resources in some cases. Or technology can increase the amount of pollution we put out and the amount of resources we use. So it all depends. This isn't a definite model. It's very hard to estimate these things sometimes. The main thing we want to come down to is we want to look at each of these factors individually, even if we can't put a number on it, and try to see how different populations are impacting the environment in different ways. Right? And this all leads back to this idea of environmental sustainability. If we want to maintain the environment for future generations, then we can't use up these resources. We have to make sure that there is enough to carry on. So we have to go back to this model and see where can we affect this in a positive way. Do we need to control the population? And this is a very controversial thing, of course. Is it m probably much easier to control the consumption that everyone has per person? Are you infringing on their personal rights if you tell them how much they can consume? Are there technologies that we can develop that can reduce our impacts on the on the environment? These are all important questions to consider and things that we're going to start looking at in this unit and throughout the year. All right, I wish you a good night. We'll come in and talk about ecological footprints next class. Thanks, enjoy your weekend.